But today, uh, we're pleased to be joined by our friend Tom McMillan. Tom is a lifelong student of the Civil War and has served on the Board of Trustees of Pittsburgh's Heinz History Center, the Board of Directors of Friends of Flight 93 National Memorial, and the Marketing Committee of Gettysburg Foundation. His books include Flight 93, The Story, Aftermath, and Legacy of American Courage on 9-11, Gettysburg Rebels, Five Native Sons Who Came Home to Fight as Confederate Soldiers, and the book he's here to talk about today, Armstead and Hancock, Behind the Gettysburg Legend of Two Friends and the Turning Point of the Civil War. Tom retired earlier this year after a 43-year career, career in sports media and communications. So ladies and gentlemen, Tom McMillan, but I will draft him here before he gets started. He can uh, pull some of our tickets here for the raffle. Jim Moran, one. Uh, Father Bob, got one. Jack Reynolds, yeah, that was three of them. Oh, no, here's the other one, sorry. Uh, Michael Anthony. All right, that's everyone. All right, so uh, Tom, the floor is yours now. Thank you for that. Well, thank you. Good to be back here at the Post. Uh, good to see so many familiar faces, even behind the mask. And after a while, you can start to figure out who's who behind the mask. Um, obviously, if you see the title of the book, you know that a lot of this relates back to the movie. And I always I'm going to start out by saying, guys, can you keep it down a little bit just back? I really appreciate it. Friends of the talk. Um, it goes back to the movie Gettysburg, and I, I, I want to make sure people know uh, I love the movie Gettysburg. It's what got me reinterested in studying the battle as an adult. A lot of people who grew up around here, my parents took me to Gettysburg when I was a kid, and I loved it. And then this happens to a lot of his life gets in the way, family, job, whatever. And so I didn't study very much. Then in 1993, the movie comes out. I went to see it on a Tuesday night at the Waterworks Center. I drove to Gettysburg three nights later. I remember driving on Confederate Avenue and looking across the field to pick its charge. It was almost like I heard the music in my head. It was like I've had the illness ever since from that, from that moment. My wife and I got married in Gettysburg. We actually have a cemetery, whatever, cemetery for, 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 for 28 years uh, going back. But I did it a little different than a lot of people who follow this, and that I watched the movie before I read the novel that it was based on, Killer Angels, which had won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction back in 1975. But as I often and still remind my, my, my Gettysburg buff friends, the key phrase is Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. The novel and the movie are based on a foundation of Gettysburg history of books. But there's a lot of fiction involved, especially with the conversations. And the novelist, Michael Sharp, did it so well that when you read it, you can't tell the difference. You can't tell what's fact and what's fiction. So it's really affected the way a lot of us, an entire generation of Civil War enthusiasts, look at the battle and these, some of these stories. And there were so many great stories in, in that book and movie, but the one that always stuck out to me from the start was the story of Louis Armas Dead and Winfield Scott. What a story that was. Two friends, almost brothers, that fight together in the Mexican War, are torn apart by the Civil War, they choose different sides. They have this teary eyed farewell out in California. And then they meet two years later in the most famous attack of the war, Pickett's Charge, where Armistead's men attack Hancock's men. Both fall. I wanted to read a book about that. There was a book. And actually, the Civil War Times just did a, a review of my book and said, I can't believe it took this long for somebody to do a book length uh, examination of these things. There wasn't. So I thought, well, okay, I'll read about Louis Armstead because there has to be a lot written about the, the Confederate general who achieved the deepest penetration in the angle of Pickett's charge. There was even a line there for 158 years, this is the only thing ever written about Louis Armstead. It's uh, 64 pages, actually 48 pages of text. 
That's done by William Watts. You probably knew that, know that name, legendary value guy, currently president of the Gettysburg Foundation. So you know this is very well researched and very well done. But that is it on Lewis on his face. Now there's a lot written about Hancock. He's the hero of the battle. He lives for 20 years after the war. Uh, he runs for president in 1880. A lot written starting late 19th century up until a few years ago. This was three years ago. There was, there was a book written by Hancock. Most of the biographies on Hancock barely mention Armstrong. Some don't mention him at all. So, so what gives here? What about this story? When I started to do the research on this, I would ask my friend, my great Civil War enthusiast friends, what do you know about the story of Armstrong and Hancock? And almost to a person, what they knew came from two scenes in that movie. It was when Armistead is having this emotional conversation with James Longstreet on the eve of battle. And he's talking about the farewell with Hancock back in California. And he quotes himself. He says, When so help me, if I ever raise my hand against you, may God strike me dead. May God strike me dead. He was almost a hard nosed soldier, but it affected him so much that he can't even bring himself to think about fighting against Hancock, even though they're going off to fight against the war that has they've chosen. But that's the movie version. There was only one person who was at that get together who ever wrote about it, and that's Hancock's wife online. She does in her book quote Armistead and saying something to the effect that may God strike me dead, but it's in a little bit of a different context. What she said, he said, I hope God will strike me dead if I'm ever induced to leave my native soil, should worse come to worst. I'd read that to my friends and say, that's not what I heard. That can't be right. That's not very personal. That's not very compelling. Well, she was there. So what happened is the novelist Michael Shard took the quote and enhanced it to draw us all in. He made up that part of it. It's a tool that novelists and movie makers use to get us into their stories. And don't blame on them. Michael Shard was writing a novel. He wasn't writing a scholarly history of the battle. The movie Gettysburg is not a documentary. So they, the tools that they use, and by the way, those conversations between Armistead and Longstreet never happened. In fact, one of them in the movie is allegedly on July 1st, Armistead was in case, but there's no evidence that, that, that they spoke at all. So all that is just concocted, but it really affects the way people the story. Next one, did they go to West Point together? I don't want to read about Armistead and Hancock at West Point together. They did not go to West Point together. Armistead, the older man, by seven years. Armistead, born 1817, Hancock, born 1820. Louis Armistead was through all of his escapades at West Point, serving in the U.S. Army as lieutenant in the Second Seminole War in Florida, before winning Scott Hancock even enrolled in West Point. They would meet later on the frontier. So next thing you're looking at is okay, letters, personal letters. have to be personal letters between these two almost brothers. None exist. There are no letters from Armistead that even mention there are two letters from Hancock that mention Armistead, but they're written years after the battle, after he's dead, and he's merely inquiring about the circumstances of Armistead's wound. Do you know researchers have okay, hmm, what is this? And, and, and I think I, I think that the lack of evidence, or at least easily accessible evidence, has led a lot of people to question uh, the depth of the French. Were they friends at all? Did Elmira Hancock just make, make this all up? So I'm standing in front of you with a, with a book that talks about the friendship, the legend of two friends. So I think you probably concluded that I concluded they were friends. I'm confident in saying they were pretty good friends. They were not almost brothers. They weren't even best friends in the modern sense in that they spent so much time away from each other. But they served together on the frontier. They fought together in the Mexican War. They built that bond as soldiers. And that bond lasted 19 years until they met on the field of discharge. So, to me, the real story is a very unique and compelling story and reflective of what the Civil War did to these guys on a personal, the soldiers that were on a personal level. It's just not the same story that we heard about in the movie Gettysburg and about the Avengers. So, who were these guys, really? Uh, Lewis Addison Armistead, again, this is all we have um, written before this, was from a, a, a very distinguished military family from Virginia. Armistead Mann had been serving the American military since the year 1680, when Lewis's third great grandfather was colonel of the horse militia in Boston County, Virginia. They fought in all the early American wars, 
And Lewis, his father, and three of his uncles were U.S. Army officers in the War of 1812. Four brothers from the same family were officers. Generation just ahead of this. So look a little bit at that, at that Armistead roster. Captain Lewis G.A. Armistead, the original Lewis Armistead. G.A. is for Gustavus Adolphus. He's named for the famed 17th century Swedish warrior. Uh, Lewis captain is a rifle unit. He's killed in action in the Battle of Fort Erie in 1814. Captain Addison Armistead commands coastal fortifications in South Carolina. He dies of disease while on duty in 1813. Lewis and Addison. What's our guy's name? Lewis Addison Armistead. He's named for two uncles who gave their lives in the war of 1812. He's military almost from the time he comes out of the But the most famous of the brothers is the third one, Lieutenant Colonel George Armistead, who defended Fort McHenry in the Battle of Baltimore when Francis Scott Key wrote the National Anthem. Not only that, but George, after the battle, took the flag, the original Star Spangled Banner. He took it off the flagpole and took it home in clear violation of Army rules. It remained in the private possession of the Armistead family for 90 years, though George's grandson donates it to the Smithsonian in the early 20th century. So if you go to the Smithsonian next week and you go to the National Museum of American History, there's the second floor, it's a display of that chamber, 200 year old pink wisp of a flag. That came directly out of the Armistead family, one of the most iconic early pieces of that. George this lived long after the war. He dies in 1818, probably from a heart attack. So the longest living and as a result, the highest ranking of the brothers is Lewis's father, Walker Keith Armistead. Not very well known today, very famous in his era. Third man ever to graduate from West Point. In 1818, Lewis is one year old. Walker's named chief engineer in U.S. Army. In 1828, when Lewis is just 11, Walker's promoted to Brigadier General, one of the highest ranking officers in what would then a very small army. So, folks, it's no coincidence Lewis Armstead became a soldier. It's no coincidence that his three younger brothers all were Confederate soldiers and fought in the Civil War, sometimes it's not known. It's no coincidence that his son, also named Walker Keith, was in the Confederate Army and on his staff at the Battle of Gettysburg, an eyewitness to the discharge. Military service is part of the Armistead DNA. 1833, Lewis wants to follow his father's footsteps. He goes to West Point. It is probably the most storied career of anyone who never graduated. Three years on campus, never got out of the first place. Um, some of that, you know, he was sick a little bit, obviously wasn't a very good student. And he got a fair amount of trouble, he would pile up the merits. But his third year on campus is 1835 36. He's uh, taking the same classes for the third time. He's moved all the way up to the middle of the academic rankings. Uh, January of 36, however, there is this entry in his West Point records. This is right out of the records, it's a little hard to read. Dead Armistead is hereby placed in a race charge with disorderly conduct in the mess hall on the 16th, limits his room. Exactly what happened here, despite what you may have heard, exactly what happened here, we don't know because those West Point records were destroyed in the fire before the Civil War. But the story that made it through the Confederate Army was that Lewis got in a mess hall brawl with another future Confederate general, Jubal Early, and hit him over the head with a plate. And if this group, you know anything about Jubal Early, it's believable because there were probably a lot of people who wanted to hit him over the head with a plate. We can laugh at it, but uh, it's a serious event at the time. Lewis and his father know about it. They conclude that the only thing he can do to win a court martial is to write a letter of resignation. So he writes a letter of resignation from West Point. There's no guarantee it's going to be accepted. But the West Point superintendent writes a note to Army headquarters in Washington, D.C., and says, We hope it will be accepted as a courtesy to bring your general Walker T. You don't want to embarrass the general. It was accepted. So Lewis resigned. So the Britain was thrown out, he was expelled, he wasn't he, he resigned. There's about a three-year gap in the story of his life. But summer of 1839, July of 1839, he gets as a civilian a commission as a second lieutenant in the US Army. There's a war going on down in Florida, the Second Seminole War. Army needs officers, he still has the Army State name. Lewis's last class at West Point graduated July 1st, 1839. Their commission's date to that point. Lewis Commission dates July 10th. All those shenanigans, not even on campus the last three years, he loses nine days of rank. Who they know people in high places? Your dad's a brigadier general, your uncle's a US congressman. He's in the army. Off he goes to the war zone in Florida. 
But the second or third day, they are rude introduction to army life. He's in hot combat with the Seminoles. But not long after that, the army makes a change in its command structure. And who is the new commander of all U.S. troops in the Florida fleet? Brigadier General Walker Keith August. So Lewis joins his staff as an aide, uh, and his experience in Florida changes dramatically. But he does get to see up close how a general as an army. He serves on his term there early 1840s, and he's sent to the frontier to a place called Fort Towson in the Oklahoma, in the Indian Territory of Brazil, Oklahoma. And that is where in 1844 he meets a young man named Winthrop Scott Hancock. Now, Hancock's story, he does not have the military pedigree of the army that's few in that era. Uh, but his father has this thing for historic names. That would be Benjamin Franklin Hancock. Benjamin Franklin Hancock and his wife have twin boys in 1824. They named one Winfield Scott, that's the famed soldier of the era. Then the other, Hillary Baker, which doesn't seem very famous to us, but they're from southeastern PA. Hillary Baker had been there. Philadelphia had fought the revolution. It was a locally prominent name at the time. Six years later, they have a third son. They named him simply John, John Hancock. John Hancock is actually with his brother Winfield on the staff of the Battle of Gettysburg. So, with Thomas and Hancock, have immediate family members with them in Gettysburg. Now, Hancock, impressive young man growing up in Norristown, PA, 16, he gets an appointment to West Point. His father isn't sure that it's such a good idea. Not only is he young, 16 is the youngest age, but he's very small. We had this image of big strapping Winfield star, big guy, right? Well, he was when he entered West Point, five feet, five inches tall. One of his fellow soldiers writes years later that during his first year on campus, the other cadets referred to Hancock as their pet. The great general Winfield Scott Hancock was their pet. <laughs> now, he does have a growth spurt. He's about six feet by the time he, uh, uh, he leaves uh, West Point. But he's small for a fair amount of time. So, you know, boys being boys on a campus, he's picked on, he's bullied a little bit. One point it gets so bad that one of his larger classmates has to stand in for him and fight one of the bullies. And that classmate is none other than Alexander Hayes, who ends up commanding a division under Hancock and Pickett Stars and Perry Valley. So the relationships with these guys. But Hayes fights the bully, big crowd out there, and he said that he, uh, they said it went on for an hour. I can't imagine that. But Hayes was declared the victor because he was the one who could get up when it was over. But Hayes, some of these little incidents, you, Hancock never, never forgot this. He writes years later, when I was a boy, I once had a difficulty and Alexander Hayes was the first to volunteer to assist me and in extracting me from my trouble became involved in aforesaid difficulty himself. I love the 19th century writing. I never forget, forgot his generous action. These guys have all these relationships long before the Civil War. Hancock, uh, not a very good student, unlike Armistead, he does graduate 18th out of 25 from the class of 1844. Uh, the great Winfield Scott did visit campus late in his final year. Uh, there's a story where the early Hancock biographies, the Hancock asked Scott if he could be sent to the regiment for his time. That probably is a little bit made up, but what happened was Hancock was posted to the regiment for his on the frontier. Uh, to 4,000 in the Indian Territory. And that's where in October of 1844, we have the first army record of Armistead and Hancock being together. They are part of a small 15-man officer corps at this very remote post on the edge of the country. It's on the edge of Texas, which is not a state of fact. Texas is a republic. As far west as you can get, it would still be the United States. They're living together and working together. They served together on the frontier for 16 months. Uh, in 1845, they are transferred together to another remote post in Oklahoma called Fort Washington, where there were only six officers. Here is a return from November of 1845. It's so hard to read. Six officers in the chaplain. Uh, Armistead is third. Hancock listed six. Evidence that they're together. This is also the only thing. Six, six officers. Do you think they knew each other? Do you think they had out to do Of course they did. This is where it all started. It's also the year of the only time period we have a piece of evidence that shows them together that is not a U.S. Army document. Here's a letter, that our, one day letter that Armistead wrote to a soldier at another uh, post. You see in the lower right hand corner his signature, L.A. Armistead. I have it up there because on the next page, upper right corner in the P.S. is W. Hancock. Yeah, L.A. Armistead, W. Hancock. Guy signed the same letter. You know, 
Not a huge piece of American history, but again, it's a cool thing in this story because it shows that they were serving together and they were friends. So yes, uh, they were in fact friends. 1846, the war with Mexico breaks out. These guys will be there young soldiers and get there. They fight, they arrive at different times. They fight together in the same regiment, the 6th Infantry. They're both brevetted for gallantry. And we know a little bit more about what Armistead did because he's older and a little higher rank. Um, and this is the time period too where it, 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 I sort of noticed that other soldiers were running on Armistead in battle always talk about how brave he was. He was a very brave man. Um, you see that word bravery and gallantry used in it, a lot of the accounts of his actions in this. This war, and he is in fact the first U.S. officer in the ditch of the final attack of Chipotle. So he, he was one of those who, who led the way. Now these guys also served together for a number of months in the post-war occupation. Between the time that the, the shooting ended and the peace treaty was signed, the U.S. Army occupied Mexico. Armistead commanded a small company, and his lieutenants were Hancock, another young man who just arrived from West Point, Henry Heath. Heath, years later in his memoirs, gives us third person confirmation of the friendship. And he writes, Armistead Hancock and I were messmates, and never was a mess happier than ours. <laughs> so these guys have they're hanging out long with this. Uh, now, Hancock and Heath <coughs> are about the same age. Armistead's old. Hancock and Heath are single. Armistead's married. This is a post war period. Hancock and Heath are going out in the town every night looking for nightlife, looking to meet young ladies. Heath in his memoir writes, he says it's great because Hancock is so good looking, he treats like a magnet for all the ladies. So even poor Henry Heath meets him. But one night Heath writes, you know, Hancock tells a young lady I love her. Next night, another lady, I love her. Next night, a third lady, I love her. And he says, Hancock, I'm going to tell these people more I love you. But Hancock, <laughs> Hancock says, Heath, we are still at war, and all is fair in love and war. So geez, there was shenanigans going on. These, those, those two, Hancock and Eva, transferred to the, the Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis uh, after the war. They do the same thing. They go out of town in St. Louis. And Heath is with him when Hancock meets his future wife, Myra Russell. You can make a case that Hancock is closer to Henry Heath than it's a result, at least socially. But the book is that Heath and Hancock is almost like Hancock's book. They were also very cool, very compelling story. Next book, perhaps the next book. So, what kind of family life did these guys have? Winfield Scott Hancock had about a stable of family life that you could have while being an army officer in the 19th century. He and Elmira had two children, a boy and a girl. Families almost always together on post. Maybe a couple long marches, but otherwise, they're with Hancock in the Third Seminole War down in Florida. They're with Hancock in California. And Winfield and Elmira were made married in Hancock's death in 1886. Armistead, by contrast, has a very tragic personal life. Between 1850 and 1855, he loses two wives and two of his three children to disease and cancer. Five year period. He's already a hard nosed soldier. This clearly, for people writing about, has a level of, level of bitterness, he becomes sullen. So the Armistead character that you see in the movie Gettysburg is not the way that Louis Armistead would have been. Life has dealt him a different, a different deck of cards. Now, in the 13-year period between the end of the Mexican War and beginning of the Civil War, 1848, 1861, these guys are almost never together. Even when they're technically posted together, Armistead always seems to be off in the tax service. There is one time in the late 1850s when the entire regiment of 6th Infantry takes a 1,000 mile march to the West Coast. Uh, several months together, but they get out west and they're split up again. Armistead is sent. I'm sorry, can you stay a little closer to the microphone? Our, our online audience is having trouble hearing you. Online, sorry, online audience, I'll stay close. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Armistead uh, is sent to what is now Arizona. Uh, to deal with some Mojave Indians who are harassing settlers. And Hancock is sent to the quaint West Coast town of Los Angeles, California, population of nearly 4,000, where he will serve as a quartermaster. And one of his duties is to supply our state's troops. One thing you can find if you've ever done any civil war research, you, try, you know this, you can also find a lot in the newspapers. Reporters love to write about the soldiers at this time. 
It is painstaking staking research. It takes a lot of patience, which I have very little. Unfortunately, my wife Pauline has a lot of it and is a very good researcher, so she has her assignments. So, okay, Armistead Hancock, summer, summer in Los Angeles, can you find it? And then 20 minutes later, I get, how about this? How about this? Extra. Outbreak of the Mojave Indians. An express arrived last night from Major Armistead at Fields Crossing in Colorado to Captain Hancock. At present residing here, conveying intelligence at the Mojave and on and on and on. Connection, these, the, the bond is still there. They're hundreds of miles apart, but they're still working together. It's an interesting, again, like the letter, it's an interesting little piece of evidence. Well, I said it does a good job. He went to his battle with the Mojave. It's the only time he ever been in the entire battle in his career. Uh, he gets a well-deserved leave of absence. He works the system and turns it into a year-long leave of absence. He's home almost the entire year of 1860 back in Virginia. He's even listed in the Fauquier County, Virginia census that summer as though he lives there. Um, he gets to reunite with his mother, with his son Walker Keith, and some friends in the region, including at a plantation nearby, the future Confederate Cavalier Turner Ashby. Ashby at the time was commanding the militia unit. They actually been sent into the John Brown raid. Ashby's men were there when John Brown was hanged. So Ashby has a pretty good sense of what's going on in the country. He, he thinks a civil war is coming. He's telling Armistead this. Armistead cannot get his arms around. He's been away for so long. He just can't grasp it. He thinks Ashby is being too negative. And he tells him, Turner, do not talk so. Let me sing you a song and wipe away your dream. And with that, Lewis Armistead on Ashby's court started to sing the Star Spangled Banner. The Ashby joined. So this is nine months before the civil war. We'll talk about that, you know, what the, what the war did. In this country. Armistead, you know, has to get back to his duties. Next post is in San Diego, California, just 120 miles south of Hancock. This place is the most of California. He gets there late December. Time he arrives, South Carolina has seceded. Other states are lining up. Mrs. Hancock writes, but during this time, many of the Southern officers in the U.S. Army went to Hancock asking for advice. What should we do? Should we stay with the Army? Hancock, very well respected. Hancock took the readings, but he didn't have much advice. This is what he said. I can give you no advice, as I shall not fight on the, on the principle of state rights, but for the Union whole and divided. I cannot sympathize with you. You must be guided by your own convictions, and I hope you will make no mistakes. This was an easy decision for Hancock. He's obviously a northerner, but he's also 100% a Union. Winfield Hancock was no abolitionist, but he wanted to fight and keep the Union. It is a very difficult decision for Lewis Armstrong. Yes, he's a native Southerner. Yes, he comes from a long line of slaveholders in this family. Yes, he grew up on a, on a farm with 19 slaves. He owned a couple of slaves himself for a time. But he and his family, their, their story, their legacy are all tied to the U.S. Army and the Star Spangled Banner. And beyond that, with the losses of his wives and his children, the Army really is his family. Talk about brothers in arms. He struggles with this, obviously, as we know, he chooses to fight for the Confederacy. And we do have, in the rare, this is a rarity, we do have his explanation, in his own words. I found this in his son's military records, not the National Archives. It's a letter that Lewis was writing to try to get his son on track to become a Confederate officer. This is the letter, you all, in the book you can read it, you can really read it here, but obviously it's beautiful hands. But this is the key point. I have been a soldier all my life. I was an officer in the Army of the U.S. whose service I left to fight for my own country and for it with my own people and because they were born and oppressed. For and with my own people. This is why Louis Armstrong fought for the Confederacy. Which leads us to the famous farewell gathering. Lots of questions about this. Uh, did Al Almira Hancock get, get the date? Did she get the guesses? Did she make it up? Did it happen at all? Most people think it didn't happen at all. I think there's enough evidence to show that something did happen. I don't mean exactly the way she described it, but that something did happen. These guys in, who were in California got together before they were off. Now, now, what did she say? In her book, she writes, this is, this is where the whole legend comes from. The most crushed of the party was Major Armistead, who, with tears which were contagious, streaming down his face, Hands upon Mr. Hancock's shoulders while looking him steadily in the eye, said, Hancock, goodbye. You can never know what this has cost me, and I hope God will strike me dead if I'm ever induced to leave my native soil. 
should worse come to worst. But if you read up on this book, which not many people have, obviously, I didn't know it existed before I was doing this. She says a couple of other things that are interesting. She says that Armistead Burlong on his U.S. Army Major's uniform to give to Hancock in case he might sometime need it. Hancock's only a captain. Here, buddy, I'm, I'm leaving the Army. You want my uniform? She also said, I'll quote her directly, that he gave her a small satchel requesting that it should not be opened except in the event of his death, in which case the souvenirs it contained, with the exception of the little prayer book intended for me and which I still possess, should be sent to his family. On the flyleaf of this book is the following Louis A. Armistead, trust in God and fear nothing. So, this was not given to Longstreet at a campfire on the eve of the Battle of Gettysburg. It was given to a buyer Hancock uh, before they left California for war. There is, however, one other account that mentions Armistead and Hancock again. It's in a really obscure biography of Hancock that was uh, written in 1880. It's written by the Reverend D.X. Junkin. Uh, who's credible? He's, he's a reverend. He also is former chaplain of the U.S. Navy. He was a friend of the Hancock family and actually did some of his research in the Hancock home. The passage I'm going to show you, he attributes to the Hancock. He doesn't quote him. I wish he quoted him directly, but he says Hancock is his source. And he writes An interesting incident in connection with General Armistice's defection from the Army is related by General Hancock. It occurred in Los Angeles early in 1861. On leaving Los Angeles, he presented Hancock with his major's uniform, saying that the latter might sometime need it. He goes on to say, he also placed in his hands for safekeeping and to be given to his family if he should fall in battle certain valuable papers. Armistead also presented to Hancock a little prayer book, which is still in the latter's possession, on a flyleaf, which Armistead trusted not to fear nothing. So this is written, this is in a book that appears seven years before Mrs. Hancock's book. So Winfield and Elmire are telling the same story. The only discrepancy is who got the prayer book, one of them. And we say that it was somebody got the prayer book. So I think this is enough evidence to show they were in the vicinity and, uh, and, and, and they, were, they, they got together. We know that uh, Louis Armstead was in uh, Los Angeles at least three times in May because it was written by the papers. And we know that he was there, we know from the letter he was there in June. So the circumstances certainly exist uh, for this to happen. I, I believe that it, it did happen. He just didn't say he got so I can get it. The original quote. Now they, they both come east. And uh first two years of the war, they don't clash in the battlefield. They're, they're some of the same battles, they're both at seven days. Uh they're both at Antietam, they're actually pretty physically close to Antietam. It's not until the third day of Gettysburg, I think. The question again when you're doing this is did they know they were fighting each other? The answer is probably. Uh, Army intelligence on the third day of a battle in the same place would be pretty good. Prisoners, battle flags. The veterans would have known that they were going against Hancock's second corps at the same ground the previous day. You might have known from prisoners that the biggest division wasn't, wasn't engaged. But the point, the cogent point here is they were not talking about facing each other. There's no evidence of that. Um, oh, winning boy. Oh, low. Folks, sometimes I get moved with this line. I'm not even sure Lowe was almost instant. There is very, very scant evidence to that. It's not a central part of the book. I wrote uh, an appendix about it. So you can read it if you want to and, just, and decide for yourself. It's a total of the whole. Um, it's an interesting side. <clears throat> now, Armistead does, uh, as we know, cut to the chase, lead 100 men over the wall. Uh, you're all familiar with this marker, the Armistead Field New Mark, which was up in the 1880s. Let's we'll see what that looked like about 100 years ago. So transportation was different. There was a cart path around. If you go to Gettysburg now, if it's lush and green, you can't see it. It's dry. You can see the outlines of that path. You can, it, it's, it's still there. But it struck. I had never seen that photo. Look at the trees. Now, is it accurately placed? Remember, I give a talk and I say that if people in the audience will say, we don't know. Who knows? Because whatever your theory is, you can find an eyewitness account to support that theory. There are eyewitness accounts who say we say as soon as he crossed the wall and fell. There's one account detailed from a man in his brigade who said he was right beside him who said he was hit as soon as he crossed the wall and staggered forward to the second line of guns where he was hit again and fell. 
There are multiple accounts from both Union and Confederate soldiers. He, he crossed the wall right ahead, all the way up to the second round of the match, where he was hit twice in the night. Uh, and he fell. One of the most credible things, maybe the most credible, is from the Union commander of the wall, Alexander Webb of the Philadelphia Union, who writes a letter to his wife just three days after the battle. So this is before all the spinning is started. He's just telling her what happened. And he says, quite straightforwardly, General Armistead, an old army officer, came over my fence and passed me with four of his men. So he did get into the angle somewhere. So in fact, who knows exactly what the second line is, but it's probably fairly accurate. Somewhere in that scene. Now, again, this group certainly knows there are several stories, legends of Armistead being assisted when he was when he was going to lay down the people. They all have Masonic implications. Louis A. Armistead was a proud member of the Masons. The first one is that he gave, he uttered a coded Masonic phrase for distress, son of a widow, and that Union soldiers who were Masons recognized this and rushed forward to help their fellow Masons. There are enough accounts of that that it's probably true, but the Seneca and me says, there is no way the Union soldiers are allowing a wounded Confederate general to just lay there, even if just for intelligence, much less. So they're going to pick up, so Lewis Armour says can be carried off the field, whether he's a, he's a Mason. The, the second one involves his encounter with Union Captain Henry Bingham, as he's laying there. Uh, in the movie, this is Chamberlain's brother. <laughs> it's, it's actually Captain Henry Bingham of Hancock's staff. Bingham's a Mason. Armistead's a Mason. Hancock's a Mason. As a result, we have the very beautiful friend to friend Masonic Memorial at the entrance to the cemetery annex in Gettysburg. Very beautiful in scale. Uh, the Masons had paid for this in 1993. Now, the original proposal was, a, was an image of Armistead and Hancock shaking hands. Ginsburg National Military Park rejected that because that didn't happen. This scene did happen. They even did, did assist Armistead. What we don't know, but despite what you've read, and I look at every source I can imagine, there is no evidence that this happened because they were Masons. They were Masons. But the, the story we hear is this, it was because Bingham knew Armistead was a Mason, that's why he, there's no evidence. The only people who know, it could, could have happened, we just don't know. The only people who know where Armistead is, Bingham, Armistead died. Bingham only wrote about this twice later in the month, both in private letters to his friend, fellow Mason Hancock. He never mentioned it. I know it's a secret society, but we think it was going to say it, say it. Hancock. Hancock never said it, Bingham never said it. Nobody ever said it. This is, Lord, this story is largely an inference. Again, it may have happened, but they're just inferring. What we do know, in one of the letters that Bingham wrote to Hancock, he attributed the quote to Armist, and it causes controversy to his head. He said, I've done him, said something, I've done him, and done you all an injury, which I shall regret or repent, I forget the exact word, the longest day I live. So Armist has escorted by me six years ago. This people have seized on this. So Louis Armistead recanted. I don't know if he was quoting correctly, but everything I know about Louis Armistead before this, and even the things he said after his death, he was not recanted. Whatever you think of, he was a proud Confederate soldier. So I, I don't buy the recanting. Now he is carried to the Union uh, Field Hospital, Levitt's Court Field Hospital at the North Bank. The Ginsburg Foundation has done a great job with that, of restoring it. You can visit it in the summer. Um, and they mark where, where, where they believe Armistead was when he died. He has two wounds in the arm and the leg. The doctors do not think they're fatal. They're stunned when he dies two days later. So like, you know, they don't know much about germs. Maybe there was another wound. The medical people I talked to said, uh, modern medical people said that they think what it would have been died that quickly was something called a pulmonary embolism, which is a blood clot in his leg when he died. So, so he didn't actually die in his wound. They bury him in a shallow grave in the Spangler farm. The story would have ended there, except for a cold-hearted Gettysburg doctor who thought, wanted to dig him up and bomb him because he thought Armistead's relatives were paid for bomb. He was right. I published a series of letters from the doctor's representative and Lewis's first cousin down in Baltimore, Christopher Hughes Armistead, the son of the hero of Fort McKen. Once the body, they do a deal. $100 early October. Body is shipped to Baltimore. Christopher takes it to Old St. Paul Cemetery, buries it in a family vault right next to the famous uncle, George Armistead, the hero of Lord Kent. 
There's always been mystery about this. Uh, I was even on a uh, ranger walk a few years ago. They said, no, Armistead's at St. Paul's, but not exactly where. That's where. The main place right outside the walls. George Armistead and the Muslims. It is a private cemetery. It's gated now, but they do tours on occasion. I was at the beginning of my band. Uh, and get a photo. So that's uh, that's where he is uh, to rest. Now that's the end of the Armistead story. Hancock, obviously, again, so many corpses made here, wounded at about the same time. Maybe a couple hundred yards away. Some sort of shot in the thigh. Turned from the field. He recovers, but he never fully recovers. He returns to action six months later. He's never the same physically. He's a pretty good day at Spotsylvania, but I think that's the reason he never rose to higher command to his own army. He might have been on that track. He stays in the army the rest of the war and actually the rest of his life. I recounted the book, it's an interesting uh, you know, post war life. He oversees the execution of the Lincoln conspirators. He fights Indians in Kansas. He's briefly the controversial military governor of Louisiana, where he feuds with Ulysses S. Grant. And he's actually in the, in the, in the presidential nomination process three times. He is a Democratic nominee in 1880. He loses a very close to that election to James Garfield by 9,000 votes. Retires from public life at that point, stays in the Army the rest of his life. 1885, he makes his final visit to Gettysburg, where he famously argues with the historian John Batchelor over the location of the proposed Hancock wounding line. <laughs> There it is today. It was put up after Hancock said Hancock was insisting it should be closer to the end. He wanted to be close to the end, but Bachelor was just as stubborn and uh and refused, but certainly there wasn't any question Hancock's bravery. He wanted to be close. So that's it. But on this trip, he does take Bachelor, despite their arguments, and several reporters and dignitaries went a tour of the battle. How great would that have been? About 20 years after the battle, you know, on well, the field of Winter with Scott Hancock, who was such a big part of all three years. Great for history that he did this. Good thing he did it because a few months later, early 1886, he tries to notice he dies. Uh, he is buried in a vault in uh, Montgomery Cemetery in Norristown, in a family vault that he built when his daughter uh, died and she was a teenager. Hancock and his daughter are buried here, his wife and son are buried elsewhere. Now, the, the Armistead Hancock story wasn't well known, wasn't much talked about late night. It wasn't talked about at all for the 20th century. It had faded from history. It wasn't until the great Civil War historian Bruce Cowan in the, the 1950s, in his book Glory Road, writes about the story using Elmira Hancock's book for the first time as his source. And it took off with public love. Shelby Foote picked it up for his trilogy. Michael Shar picked it up for Killer Angels. Movie Gettysburg picks it up for the movie. And now it's one of the most famous stories in the history of the world, one of those overnight sensations that took 100 years. And, and maybe uh, one of the few people who wouldn't have been surprised by that was their old friend Henry Heath. And he published, I don't know when he wrote it, but his memoir was published in the 1890s. And I would conclude with this quote, which I had never seen used before. He wrote, Those two regimental associates, best mates, and devoted friends never met again on earth, but I'm sure have met again in heaven. I think Armistead was killed by Hancock's troops, and Hancock was wounded by one of Armistead's command. What a commentary on civil war. Thank you. Any questions? Did Armistead's son participate in the attack? We don't know. I Can don't you, think. Can you repeat the question? Um, I'm not sure. the, the question was Did Armistead's son participate in the attack of his charge? We don't know. My guess is no, because no one mentioned. I've got to believe there's many of those soldiers who wrote about A lot of the soldiers who wrote the pictures wrote about it. Um, nobody mentioned his son. There, there is one account that he was seen alongside Armistead before the charge happened, but they were both mounted. You know, Armistead. My guess is Armistead, with all the losses that he had, is going to tell his son to stay home. He wasn't there. So uh, his son, Walker Keith Armistead, uh, went back to that. He lost his commission after Lewis was killed. He went back to the cavalry. He served the rest of the war. Uh, moved north, buried at the center of Daniel Webster, and never wrote about his civil war. 
opportunity. Some of these, some of these guys just never wrote about it. So that part of the story we can't tell. But I have to believe that if his son was in it, somebody would have seen it. Okay. All we can do is guess what's in these things. Yeah. Do you want to comment about uh, Bingham, uh, Captain Bingham being the local guy? Being a local guy from here? Uh, no, no, wasn't Captain Bingham. I, I don't, I, I didn't do a deep dive on Bingham's life story. I just, I just know his involvement. Okay, well, I understand this is 140. I read it. One thing about doing this stuff, it really knows this. You, you think you know a lot about the Civil War. You do something, it is so humbling. You know, you can't know, you know, and you dig, I dig down deeply into the lives of Louis Lawrence Ted and Whitfield Scott Hank. The periphery people, you just, Okay, but it's why, it's why we're all still here, right? But we all keep going back. So you're always trying to, I don't know much about its history. I just go I'm in contact with this particular story. But it is kind of an important thing that a Hancock staff officer, it's natural he would have been there. Hancock commanded that part of the field, but the Hancock staff officer. So one thing that, that I forgot to add about one of the, the whole Masonic thing is that if you read Bingham's entire account, he he's told a Confederate officer is down, he's going to help him. He's told it's General Longstreet, who is not a Mason. So he is going to assist who he thinks is General Longstreet. It's not until they get there that, 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 that they make the introduction and, and, he, and he makes that connection with them. With the so that's a, you know, some of these legends come up. It doesn't mean they're not true, but when you're doing a book, you're looking for evidence. And some of these legends that I even think might be true. There's no evidence. People have kind of put two plus two and got four, and maybe four is the right answer, but maybe it's not. And it's why we keep, it's why we keep going. You know, I, they're, they're both the great and frustrating thing is some of these stories we could just never. Where did Armistead go? I don't know. Okay. You know like, like I said, you, you can find an eyewitness that this account to support whatever you believe. We had a question online. <clears throat> Do Armstead and Hancock have any living descendants around today, and do they know each other? They do have, certainly Armstead, they're, they're, the Armstead family is vast. There are lots of Armsteads. Uh, the original Armstead uh, came from England in 1635, so their family tree is so vast. I don't know that they know each other. I've never, I've never heard of them. Because I think as, as time moves on, one thing I do know is that Louis Armstead's direct descendants fought in the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, that's as far as I took it, but I'm sure I'm going to tell that the, the, the military part of the family goes on. Yeah, one more comment. I happen to be able to spend a farm on uh, weight loss and uh, two licensed battlefield guides over over there about 30 or 40 years ago and uh, talking about Armstead, Armstead, and weight loss at these guys for the Physicians from Johnstown, because of the surprise of him passing so quickly, because his wounds were treatable. And uh, that's what they said to They said pulmonary. And yeah, the question was that with the, the cause of the that, and that's modern, every, every modern military or medical person talks it. That's what it had a little bit. That, that there are a couple of things that would have caused death, and the other ones, a medical person, wouldn't have, more, wouldn't have been any trouble. So you know, they, but they didn't, you know, they didn't know much about medicine. But they were, they, they were astounded that he died. Yeah. So if, imagine this story where it would have gone if Lewis Thomas had survived. And you know, survived. Mm -hmm. We'll never know. Mm -hmm. Let me say one thing. So somebody asked, Armistead's nickname drove me crazy. You there, you Google Lowell Armistead, you'll find 440,000 mentions of Lowell Armistead. There is not one contemporary Civil War soldier in the 19th century that calls him Lowell Armistead. The only reference to Lowell Armistead, from a historic standpoint, is in a much criticized book that Mrs. Pickett came out with in 1913, 50 years after the battle of uh, alleged letters from George Pickett. Historians have roundly said that these letters were made up. She didn't produce the letters. Among his Gettysburg letters, he was identifying uh, points on the battlefield, that the names of which the Confederate sources would not have known during the battle. That's the only reference, this flower reference to love. As I, I say it in, in, the, in, in my appendix, 
That doesn't mean that Pickett didn't call him low and didn't tell Mrs. Armstrong. There's just no evidence of it. But it strikes me that no one else and his, his prominence is balanced ever mentioned. So I think that's one of those things that comes from that book of letters, and it's such a good story. We love good stories. And I've had people argue with me about this. I said, well, you, you, you just because you want that to be his nickname. And the movie is emblazoned that in all of our minds. But that's the only reference uh, all those years later from a letter that we don't have. So I, I had to think. Just didn't, it doesn't really matter, but it just shows you how uh, popular history and legends affect what we think today. Thank you, folks. I really enjoyed it. I grab a copy of the book. I just finished it last month. It's outstanding. I learned a lot myself. Um, thank you again for coming, everyone. We will see you back here in January. Thank you. Thank you.